All right, guys, decided that we're going to keep this ebony train rolling. Today, we're going to talk about the queen of Jhansi, India, Rani Laxmibai. Her story starts off in the city of Varanasi. Upon their arrival, her parents had given birth to a young girl, bestowing her with the name Mani Karnika thereafter. For the most part, her parents would just call her Manu for short. Her father was making his ends by working for an official that served under the Maratha Empire. This empire being a huge network that dominated a large part of the Indian subcontinent before Manu was born. But unfortunately for their family, the man that was employing her father had passed away, which left her pops without a job and made their family homeless. Thankfully, his employer's brother Baji was able to swoop in and give them a place to stay in the city of Bether. From here, her pops became one of Baji's court advisors and was slowly able to muster up the resources to get back on his feet. A couple of years down the road, the family would face yet another tragedy where Manu's mother ended up passing as well. Manu was only four at the time. Her pop said he's not gonna let this hold him back He'll just have to love his daughter enough for the both of them. Now that it was just her and her pops, Manu spent a lot of time in her childhood taking the world in from a perspective of being under his wing instead. This also meant that she grew up around a lot of men, which includes Nana, who was their landlord's son. Because of this, Manu started to develop very tomboyish behavior while she was still at an early age. She learned how to use the sword, hand-to-hand -hand combat, the rifle, and even how to ride on horseback in a similar fashion to most of her peers. It's even been said that she was able to accomplish feats such as saving her friend Nana, who was several years older than her at the time, from being stomped out by his own horse when she was only seven. As the young girl began to climb up in age, she proceeded to marry the king of the city, Jhansi, at the age of 14. And since she would be the new queen, it was a common part of their custom for the Rani, or the queen, to take up a new name. From that point on, Manu became known as Laxmibai. She later gives birth to her own child that quickly passes away due to him having a broken heart. After trudging through the death of their first son, the king fell into illness and adopted another son so he could have someone that he could pass his legacy. The king begins to write out his will, stating that he wanted his son to be the heir and that Manu would be the co-ruler since her child would be too young to do it on his own. The king then passes away and although their child should have had the right to the throne, British India didn't feel like that was the case. The problem here was that the British had just released a new policy called the Doctrine of Lapse, which stated that they could take a nation if they felt like the ruler was incapable, or in this case, if the ruler didn't have an heir lined up whenever he kicked the bucket. So with the British denying Manu's son his right to the throne, John C. was put into the hands of one of their people instead. They gave her some funds, which she ultimately had to use to pay her husband's debts anyway, and they told her, I'm gonna need you to bounce. Manu stressed the fact that she wasn't going to give up on her city that easily. For years on end, she made attempts to send letters to the British officials in hopes that they would give her a chance and listen to her side of the story. But nothing ever came of this in response. This is when things started to take a huge turn. At the time, the sepoys, or the Indian soldiers who served under the British army, were also fed up with the British. There were several things that the government had been enforcing that the soldiers didn't agree with, but the final straw was concerning the ammo that the soldiers received for their new weapons, the Enfield P-53 rifle. These guns were supposed to be superior to their old models. However, in order for you to load them, you had to bite down on the cartridge to release the gunpowder and the ball whenever they needed some ammunition. The problem with this was that the cartridges were said to have been greased 
with the fat of beef and pork which was a pretty big deal considering that pigs were taboo to the muslims and the cow was a sacred animal to the hindus so in the city of mirit over 80 soldiers said you know what we've had it with you guys we're not gonna use these and these same soldiers were put into shackles and tossed into prison their comrades then shot down the british officers and kicked off the beginning of the indian rebellion now once the news about this rebellion made its way to the city of Jhansi, manu asked officer skin could she gather a group of armed soldiers for her own protection and with all this news about the rebellion spreading throughout the city the people of John C were starting to get a little nervous. So Manu holds a ceremony gathering all the women in the city and she told them, everybody just take a chill pill. The British are some hoes. I guarantee you there's nothing to be worried about. Time passes. Eventually it got to the point where the people in John C started to rebel as well. Officer Skeen made an attempt to save the other Brits by telling them that they should hide in the John C. Fort. The rebels then surrounded the fort telling them that we'll let you all go free if you're willing to drop your weapons. The officers dropped their weapons and the rebels laid out everybody that was in the building. The officers, their wives, the children, dozens of people took the fall. This includes Officer Skeen who had temporarily been working as an overseer to the city. So Manu sends a letter to the British about the incident describing how things went down. Oh, it was horrible. They killed everybody on site. They extorted me for my money and they told me if I don't do what they say that they're gonna blow up my palace. The audacity. She went on to ask the British what should she do about the situation for the time being. The British were already dealing with several outbreaks all over India. So they decided to let Manu hold the city down until they could get someone out there that would get things back in order. For a while, Manu was able to keep the city at peace. She took the steps that were necessary to keep everybody out of harm's way. However, a month after the first massacre, more rebels showed up trying to invade the streets of Jhansi and take the city for themselves. She then sends out another letter to the British. Are y'all still coming? Like, what's the deal? No response. So since the British weren't sending her any help or responding to any of the letters that she had sent their way, Manu decided to take things into her own hands. She linked up with some of the rebel leaders from neighboring districts, fortified the city's walls, and rounded up about 20,000 people to fight in her defense. Now she has the Brits' attention. The British didn't send her any help, but what they did send was a report back to the headquarters on the things that she's been doing. Uh, sir, our scout says that the queen has cannons on the wall? That she's rounded up thousands of soldiers to fight for? It sounds to me like she wants to go to war. This was a bad look for Manu since it hadn't been too long since the first incident had passed. Not only that, but the first time that things went down in Jhansi, one of the guys reported that she paid the rebels. He never included the fact that she was threatened to pay the rebels, just that she paid the rebels. Now, it sounds like she just wanted a hit job, but they gave her the benefit of the doubt and they decided to let it ride. Now that they've made these discoveries with this new report, they're kind of looking at Manu like, you probably were the one who started the first massacre. The British then send out Commander Hugh to take out more rebel camps with John C being priority on the list. He pulls up to the city walls telling Manu, if you don't let us in right now, we are gonna tear this whole city up. Now, up until this point, Manu had been trying her best not to go into war with the British. She knew that most of her soldiers were considered rebels so even if she surrendered, they would have all just been killed. And since she was the one in charge, she probably would have met the same fate as them. There was no turning back. Her response, oh, now you wanna talk. 
couple of weeks ago, I couldn't even get a text back. Now you want to talk. Ain't nothing to talk about now. You want your city back? Come and take it. The commander then told Manu, say less. I want everybody in this bitch over the age of 16 dead. On Britain, cuz. And don't kill the women. So the two sides go into battle for a few weeks. And after giving it everything they had, the soldiers that were on Manu's side finally started to take a dive. Not really going down how I imagined this in my head. Manu was very aware that things were about to get real ugly real fast. So she straps her son to her back, rounds up a portion of her troops, and dipped out heading over to the fortress of Kalpi. Here she linked up with more rebel leaders and had yet another unsuccessful bout with the British, causing them to push off yet again to the city of Gwalior. Commander Hugh begins to close in on the city, prompting the leaders to ask Manu could she guide them into their final battle. Manu does so accordingly, hitting the field with her troops in male clothing. In her final moments of this battle, Manu decided to charge at one of the British troops, which led to her getting knocked off her horse in the exchange. She then makes another attempt to fire at the man that knocked her down, and this assailant ended up shooting her to death with his own weapon. Now that the queen was out of the picture, the rest of her troops had lost any inspiration that they had left. The city of Gwalior fell, her allies were executed, her father was hung, and the British eventually put an end to the Indian Rebellion altogether. Despite the fact that her efforts would give her an early leave, Manu was described as one of the strongest and most fearsome rebel leaders of them all, earning nicknames such as the Indian Jezebel, or the Indian version of Joan of Arc, which is probably why they used Joan of Arc's art style as a base for her character. Nonetheless, she still put up a good fight, and she can now be summoned in the Saber class because of it. That about wraps it up. If you enjoyed the video, please like it up so we can get this trending. Feel free to add information as you see fit, and let me know what you guys think about it. It's your boy Sire. Better I'm all in. I'm out. Better I'm all in. Put me in the jungle. I get us all mixed. Don't play my wave. Know what? Let them all sink. I don't need therapy. I got so big. Even when they talk crazy, I still don't shrink. I'm a blackout. Michael Blackson skin tone. Homie, gotta sit for a while back home. Highline bling if you get.